Okay, good morning, everybody. Bill Lester here with University of Florida IFAS Extension in Hernando County. And good morning, and welcome to today's virtual plant clinic. Today's plant clinic is going to be a fairly short one because I have a conference that I'm kind of participating in, I have to get back to. And my only guest and helper here today is going to be Teresa from our office. And she is always busy answering the phone and answering emails and taking care of people who stop by the office with every kind of question imaginable. And right now we also have one of our brand new master gardeners in there helping her that she's trying to get situated. So if any of you have a question, please just go ahead and type it in the um, comments section right underneath where you see the video, my smiling face and look who's back. It's Teresa, Teresa, my happy helper. <laughs> I like to tell people that Teresa knows everything. So if you have a question, no, ask Teresa. She knows pretty much everything. No, I don't. <laughs> good morning, Teresa. How are you? How are you at the office today? Good, good. Beautiful day here today. Good. So. It, it sounds like people are calling already and stopping in and the doorbell is dinging. And... Yeah, so I may go off and on a couple of times. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Well, it's always a busy day at the office. And if you ever have any questions and you want to get a hold of us, if you just give us a call, there's our phone number. Chances are when you call, you're going to get Teresa on the phone and she will do her best to help you out. A lot of times uh, we are starting to have master gardeners return to our office to help with answering questions, either on the phone or through email or from walk-ins. So she may pass your question off to a master gardener to look into and answer. Um, she may pass your question off to me, in which case I'll get back with you just as soon as I can. Like I said, I am technically in a conference at the moment. Well, not really. I'm taking a short break from it, but I have to get back to a conference here shortly. So once again, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and ask them now. Ask them quickly. Ask them frequently. But I know one question that came up at the office that Teresa wanted me to address is we had a gentleman come in who's putting a citrus tree in his, where is, is it front yard, Teresa? I believe it is, but he, he wants to know about mulching uh, with rock, if that would uh, you know be doable. Um, and he also wants to know about using a homemade um, weed killer. Okay, well, those are two separate questions there citrus trees generally when you plant them you need to keep a large clear area around them so even though you may be installing a small citrus tree that's only knee high at this point you bought it in a three gallon pot you need to clear at least about a 10 foot diameter for it eventually and keep that area just bare dirt underneath it and the reason when you're thinking, well, you guys always recommend and Lily recommends to mulch plants to hold in moisture and help block the weeds. Citrus is a little bit different. Citrus, if you have any kind of wood chip mulch underneath it and that mulch is anywhere near the trunk, it'll encourage a disease, a fungal disease is called foot rot. And what that does is it rots the trunk of the citrus tree and kills it and makes the tree fall over eventually. And obviously nobody wants that happening with their citrus tree. So commercially, they just keep the area underneath citrus trees completely bare dirt. That's what we recommend. That's gonna be the best for homeowners. If you really have to have some kind of mulch under it, you can put a light covering of mulch under your citrus tree, but keep it at least a foot back from the trunk of the tree, just for safety, so that you're not gonna develop foot rot or that fungus is going to kill your citrus. Using landscape rock under a citrus tree is probably not the best idea. You may be able to use it and the tree is going to perform okay. The problem with landscape rock is it can get hot, especially during the summer. <clears throat> and obviously if you're using a white or light colored rock, it's not going to heat up as much as if you have black lava rock under a citrus tree that was probably going to cook the roots eventually long term so i personally really wouldn't recommend landscape rock although you can try it 
the tree may do just fine. But the problem is that that rock is probably going to heat up some during the summer and any of the tree's roots that are near the surface are going to get hot and that's not going to be the best for the tree that might cause problems with it long term. Now, the other question is he wanted to try, what is that, the, the homemade weed killer that the recipe floats around on Facebook groups mm -hmm. all the time? And vinegar and water. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we really do not recommend using that concoction as a weed killer because none of those items, Dawn dish liquid and vinegar that you buy at the grocery store or Epsom salts, none of them are labeled as an herbicide. So none of them have been tested for their safety on plants. Uh, there are no directions as far as how much you should, you know, mix in a gallon of water, how much you should apply, how often you should apply it. It's completely do it at your own risk. I have seen things where people swear that, oh, I mix this up and I spray it on my weeds and it kills the weeds and it works great. I know that the vinegar that you buy at the grocery store is maybe 5% acidity. And that is acidic, but not acidic enough to reliably kill weeds. Commercial organic growers can buy specially formulated vinegar that is labeled as an herbicide and has directions and uh, EPA uh, qualifications and, you know, OKs and labels to be used as an herbicide. They buy it by a 55 gallon drum. It's extremely expensive and it's very acidic. It's a lot more acidic and stronger than what you could ever buy at a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And even for them, I've heard they get very mixed results. Yeah, it works OK on some weeds. A lot of other weeds, it doesn't affect them at all. Using dishwashing liquid on um, as any kind of pest control, weed control, whatever it might be, it's not labeled for that. There are no directions for how to use it as either an insecticide or an herbicide, and we really can't recommend that. It's completely use it at your own risk. If it kills your plant, you know, it kills your plant. You have no, you can't go back to the manufacturer the company that makes Dawn and complain that they killed your plant because they didn't put directions on the label for you to use it on your plant in the first place. So it's completely at your own risk and buyer beware. And hopefully things will, it won't kill your plant. Things will turn out. Okay. And Epsom salts, you can use Epsom salts as a fertilizer. What Epsom salts are, are magnesium sulfate and magnesium is an essential nutrient for all plants. It's, Epsom salts are highly soluble, so if you mix it up in water and water your plant, your tree, your palm tree with it, it's going to be there today and gone very quickly. As soon as you water again or it rains, it's going to leach and go away. Uh, magnesium is not a pollutant, so we're not particularly worried about that with, you know, Weaky Watchy Springs or anything else or poisoning groundwater. It's just not very helpful or very effective. So... Hopefully that helps with his questions. Mm -hmm. We have another quick question here. The mulch question from last week. What is pine fine mulch and where can I get it? Pine, and it's kind of a hard one to say, pine fines are when they make wood chip mulch, when they strip the bark off of pine trees, the big chunks are called big chunk mulch. I'm not sure if that's the technical correct term or not, but you can get pine bark mulch in big pieces or smaller pieces, or if you find a mulch yard that screens it, you can get the really, really, really tiny little pieces of mulch, of pine bark mulch. Obviously, the really tiny pieces are going to break down much faster. They're going to compost into the soil and help to build your soil up quicker. A lot of companies will use the fines, the really fine little teeny tiny pieces of um, uh, mulch to mix into potting soil. So if you get a bag of potting soil or seed starting mix and you, you know, start looking through it very closely, you'll find teeny tiny little wood chips. You generally cannot find that at a big box store. You would have to try contacting a uh, mulch yard or maybe a landscape company that sells bulk mulch. They sell it by the dump truck load 
or if you want to come in with your pickup truck, they dump, you know, a couple yards in the back of your pickup truck. They may screen it out, but what you have to do is take the pine bark chips and screen them and screen out the little tiny pieces. So the little tiny pieces are the pine fine mulch. And what that does is it's going to break down quicker. It makes a fine mulch. It just doesn't last as long as the big chunks. Big, the bigger the chunk, the longer it's going to last before it breaks down. The finer the piece, the quicker it breaks down. So I'm not really positive where to find them. Maybe Teresa, if she gets bored this afternoon, could try looking online. That's the kind of thing that I just start Googling and looking online for where you could buy either buy the bag already screened or some place where you can make arrangements to get some and screen it. So Phyllis, as always, you are very welcome. Like I said, I thought about canceling today because I am supposed to be at a, a conference. I need to get back to it maybe 10 minutes or so. So we can do a couple more quick questions here. Um, oh, here's one for Teresa may know this one. So a small black snake and it had an orange trim or probably the little orange stripe near its head. It is not poisonous. Um, Teresa, what is that? That's a ring neck snake? Yes. Yes, it is. I'll send her a picture. Okay. A little document on it. And they're pretty common. Um, mm -hmm. They're very pretty snakes, and they're they're small. They, I mean, they never get really huge. They're always, you know, maybe a what what would you say is the biggest they get? A foot or less? Mm, I don't know. Pull it up. I've seen it before in my yard, uh, once or twice before, and they're always really. They're gosh, maybe six inches. 15 inches. Fifteen is, I think, the max on it. So they're not dangerous. They're very friendly snakes. Of course, with any snake, if you go and catch it and start poking your finger in its face, it will bite you. So don't catch snakes and don't poke at them, and you won't get bit. So that's that's falls under the, the heading of a friendly snake. And snakes are always beneficial to have in your yard. They're going to catch and eat toads and lizards or if they're real small they're going to catch insects so they help to keep things under control in your yard so that's a friendly snake um kimberly here is a very good question and i know the answer to this one right off the top of my head and thank goodness Teresa is here so what should i use to get rid of kogan grass university of florida has done the research and they have a um edis fact sheet on Kogan grass control. And they actually have a three year program where you combine cutting it, burning it and spraying it. But you have to do the right thing at the right time of year. And you have to do it over a period of three years. And Teresa, I can see is pulling up the fact sheet right now. So if you contact our office and just give her a call in a little bit, Teresa can go ahead and email that to you. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to follow. If you take that fact sheet and tape it to the refrigerator and follow it, you will get Kogan grass control. Mm -hmm. We really never talk about eradicating it because you're ne probably never going to get rid of 100% of it. But if you have a Kogan grass problem, you can get a good degree of control over it and you're going to have far less of it. So go ahead and contact Teresa at the office and she'll get you a copy of that. So, um, or Teresa, if you are on, well, no, I know that um, Cindy is probably watching us live on Facebook. So if she can go ahead and include that in the chat, we'll get that in the chat underneath the presentation here to you one way or another so that you'll get that information. So we have a question from mystery Facebook user it says, I hear about people using chip delivery services. Is it safe to use in my yard? I worry about termites. Thank you. This is a situation where you can get signed up on a list and companies, I believe the companies that do the tree trimming around power lines and then chip the trees up, 
will come by when they have a truckload of wood chips and drop it in your yard, in your driveway, wherever you tell them to dump it for free. And if you really want a ton, a truckload of wood chips, this is a great free way of getting them. The problem is you get what you get. You get whatever they cut down and chipped up that day. If it's invasive trees, that's what you get. If there were some beer cans and trash and paper and everything else thrown in with it, you get that too. I would think the termites are not going to be a serious issue because the trees they just cut down and ground up most likely are not going to contain uh, termites. So termites are not really uh, a major concern. What can be a concern is if they throw things in, like I'll give you a good example. I got some compost from uh, a friend of mine who works at a local uh, small farm and they compost truckloads of wood chips. They have huge piles of wood chips. They turn them, they compost them, they fully compost them. They work them into the soil. They grow vegetables in it. And he gave me like 10 five gallon buckets of finished compost for me to use in my garden. So I brought it home and I dumped it in my garden. I put some uh, in containers also because I grow a lot of vegetables in containers. And darn if I didn't get a couple of air potato vines growing out of it. So the air potato vines got thrown in the truck. They got chipped up. They got dumped. They got composted. They got worked into the farm soil. They got dug up into a bucket into my yard and it still sprouted. And I had a couple of um, air potato vines. Since I only had a few, it was no problem for me to pull them up and control them. But there's a possibility that if you get those free wood chips, you're going to get whatever they give you. So it may be um, uh, a little stinky. It may have some ground up beer cans and soda cans and trash in it. It will have to, you're going to have to allow it to sit and compost for a while until you're working into your soil. Fresh wood chips are fine as a mulch, but working it into your soil and planting in it right away is not going to work very well. So there's pluses and minuses to it. On the plus side, it's free. Can't beat that. So, oh no, Kimberly has a question about as far as growing blackberries, thornless or with thorns and why? So you can grow blackberries successfully here in Hernando County and across central Florida. There are a whole bunch of different varieties you can get. And all the names are the names of Native American Indian tribes like Arapaho and Apache and a lot. I can't remember all the different variety names. And that's because they were all developed by University of Arkansas. And they just named all of them after different Indian tribes. And all those different varieties will grow here. I know local commercial growers, because it is becoming a viable commercial industry, people growing blackberries for profit. And we do have a couple of UPIC blackberry farms in Hernando County. Uh, they grow well, uh, but they're kind of broken up into two big groups. You have the old fashion varieties, the ones that have been grown for a long time that have thorns and they have lots of thorns and they will scratch you up when you're in there working in them or picking the blackberries. And then you have newer varieties that are bred to be thornless and they get blackberries just fine and grow well also. From what I've heard from the commercial growers, the old fashioned thorny varieties tend to be a bit more productive. But the jury is still out on that a little bit. University of Florida is still doing uh, different variety trials on which varieties are going to grow the best, which ones, you know, don't grow as well. And local growers are also playing with all the different varieties to see which ones go best. But the thornless ones will grow well, and they're obviously easier to work with because they don't have thorns. They are preferred by you pick blackberry farms because obviously they don't have thorns their customers won't get scratched up and unhappy but technically i believe it's still true that the old-fashioned thorny varieties are more productive so phyllis says that she's seen i believe it's the ring that snakes 
They always seem friendly. They run away quickly and they are no bother. That's true. And we do have a couple different types of snakes that are very, very small um, ring neck snakes. There's another um, blind snake that you'll find a lot of times in potted plants that you yeah, have bimini? out in your yard. What kind is that? Bimini? Is that it? Bimini? I think, yeah, I think the bimini blind snake. Mm -hmm. And they really like potted plants. And they're very small. They're maybe, gosh, six inches or a lot of times less. Some people will see them and actually think it's some kind of earthworm because it looks like an earthworm. Uh, especially if it's very small and we'll get calls every once in a while and pictures, you know, what is this? Do I have huge earthworms in my yard? It's like, no, you have a little bimini blind snake. So we do have a lot of snakes. Um, only a very few of them are poisonous. So the majority of snakes that you're going to see in your yard are harmless, but you always want to be careful. So if you don't know exactly what they are, you really don't want to try catching them or playing with them. So hopefully most of you, when you see a snake, aren't trying to catch it. So Teresa did show a couple things here. We do have that University of Florida fact sheet on Kogan grass control. And she put one up here on blackberries and blackberry production. And also University of Florida has a very good database on different snakes that live here in Florida. And how to identify them so if you're really interested in the types of snakes that you have in your yard or if you're out there and being very observant and you see one and you want to know what it is and you see a, a big one with red and yellow and black stripes on it it's like oh no is this a coral snake is it a rat snake what is it university of florida has a lot of really good um picture databases to be able to identify them from i am not a snake expert so other than being able to identify a black snake and a coral snake in my own backyard, that's kind of the, and ring snakes, ring neck snakes, that's kind of the extent of my uh, snake expertise. So you want to refer to uh, University of Florida expert information or just call Teresa. Teresa knows pretty much everything. She hates it when I say that probably. Yes. So I think we're getting to the point where I'm going to have to be checking off here pretty soon and getting back to my conference before I get in trouble with my boss and they notice I'm not there. So if anybody has any last minute any quick questions here, please go ahead and toss them in real quick. Otherwise, let me share with you if you are ever interested or if you need to contact our office, once again, there is our phone number. And if you're ever interested in any of the classes that we offer online, and I know that we do things, sometimes they're on Zoom, sometimes they're here on Facebook, it may be Facebook Live, whatever it might be, if you go to www.hernandoextension.com, that is a freestanding website, you don't have to have Facebook or anything else to get to it, just go there, and you can scroll through a whole listing of all of our upcoming classes and all the information you, you need to know to be able to tune in live and watch it and learn from it is right there. So if it's on Zoom, it'll have a Zoom link. If it's on Facebook Live, it has the exact time, the speaker, the link, exactly where to go. And if you look at that and you still have questions, just call the phone number right above that, 352-754-4433. And you could ask either Teresa or today we have Sydney in the office helping out also. So you can ask either one of them your question about our upcoming classes and they can help you out. And of course, if worse comes to worse and you have complicated questions, pictures, whatever it might be, feel free to shoot me an email. That's always the best way to get in touch with me. Wlester at ufl.edu. And I will get back to you just as quick as I can. Some days it seems like I'm here online all day and I'm popping between conferences and Facebook and Zoom and talking to Teresa and answering emails. But if you send me an email, that way I'll see it and we'll put you right in line there for me to get back in touch with and, and help you figure out what your problem is and how to solve it.
So let me see. I do not see any more questions here. So Teresa, do you have anything else you'd like to share with us? Just real quick, I just want to let everyone know we're having a uh, 2020 peanut butter challenge, uh, help us fight hunger. So we will be collecting jars of peanut butter from the public from October 1st to November 25th. If anyone can help us, come down to the office, bring us your jars of peanut butter so that we can help feed the hungry. And it'll be distributed to local food banks here in Hernando County. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So if you come by the office to ask Teresa a question or bring in a leaf or a plant, make sure you bring at least one jar of peanut butter also. <laughs> that that will be your your entrance fee to get into the office well they don't have to do that but it would be nice we'll still let you in but yeah we, we definitely appreciate the donations so okay guys with that uh thank you very much and we will be back here again next week and i think next week we're going to drag the camera in the other room and we're going to Teresa, make sure you tell Sydney that she needs to be there at 10 a.m. next Thursday because we're going to put her on here also. So, Excellent. Okay, great. You can go ahead and forewarn her, I guess. So, great. Thank you very much, everybody. We really appreciate you uh, joining in here and asking your questions and all, all the love and thanks and everything else you give us. And until next week, we will see you then. Thanks. Bye.